Hi, my name is Michael Hua, and I'm Helion's Director of Radiation Safety and Nuclear Science. I'm really excited to be presenting Trenta data today and how we use Trenta data to verify fundamental FRC scaling behavior. Before getting into the data, I want to talk about how our machine works. We run a symmetric machine where we make field reverse configurations or FRCs on either side and merge them in the center to do fusion. This pro the process looks like this. We'll puff gas in on either side of the machine and form these FRCs or plasma donuts. We then accelerate them into the center of the machine where they will merge and we turn up our compression field magnets. By turning up the magnetic field, we increase the plasma temperature, we squeeze, we increase density, and the plasma will reach fusion conditions. Fusion will occur and charged particles will be born and trapped inside the plasma. This increases the plasma pressure and that plasma will push back on the magnetic field. FRCs have a unique property where they're very high beta. That means that the ratio of plasma pressure to magnetic pressure is very high, it's very close to one. And that means with very high efficiency, as we push back on the magnetic field, we can recapture electricity. This is at a much higher efficiency than thermal cycles. And it's again, unique to FRCs because a lot of other plasma configurations have very low betas. and You can't trap at a higher efficiency than beta. I mentioned that we get our energy from charged particles, and that allows helion to pursue advanced fuels like deuterium-helium-3 fusion. Helium-3, the nucleus of a helium-3, is called a helion, and that's why we're helion energy. We're unique in this way. And the reason that we like this fuel is not only does it create charged particles where we get energy, creates a proton and an alpha, it doesn't create radiation nor radioactive byproduct. Of course, there's no free lunch in energy. The deuterium is still inside the chamber, and that deuterium will fuse in side reactions, 50% of the time creating a triton, the other 50% of the time creating a neutron. This neutron acts as a very useful diagnostic for how much fusion is occurring. And this neutron is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. To detect these neutrons, we need neutron diagnostics. You're seeing two of them on the slide right now. On the left, we have organic scintillation detectors, or EJ301 liquid scintillators. On the right, you're seeing our silver activation detector. The way that silver, the silver detector works is that thermal neutrons will interact with the silver, activate it, turn it radioactive, and then that silver will decay. When it decays, we put it next to other detectors that will detect the decay products and register it as an electric signal. And so what you're looking at are sheets of silver and sheets of scintillator. Now these are just two detectors of many that we fielded on Trenta. We had other activation foils, CR39 etch detectors, and other scintillators. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna focus on these two detectors that we use to measure relative yield. So generally, if we see double the, double the signal in these detectors, we expect that double the fusion happen during that pulse. We're now looking at raw data from each of these detectors. On the left, you're looking at the organic scintillator data, where we're looking at individual pulses as well as a cumulative signal integrated over the duration of a pulse. On the right, you're looking at the silver data. I mentioned that silver gets activated and it has a characteristic 24.6 second half-life. This is very useful because during a shot we can have electromagnetic noise or a lot of other things going on. And so that 24.6 second half-life allows us to uh, decouple from all of those effects and look at uh, look at the signal after your pulse is done. So what you're looking at is a histogram, a time histogram of detections inside the detector showing that characteristic decay. One of the things that's important in these detectors and for our systems is to verify shot-to-shot -shot variability. And we see that it's quite low. On the left, what we've done is we've done multiple shots with the same input parameters, and we see does this machine with the same inputs produce the same outputs? And what we see is the variability is about 8% with both of these detectors. This means that the variability in our signal, as well as the variability in the machine performance, is quite low. And looking at just the detectors, by applying, by applying Poisson statistics to the detectors, we see that in an individual shot, we expect 3% statistical uncertainty inside the detectors. Before looking at the trend and how we scale, I want to talk about what we should expect. And so we, where we start is we take the NRL plasma formulary for fusion yield, and what we can do is combine that with other data and FRC equilibria relations to come out to 
an expression based on magnetic field, trap flux, and coil radius. Now, this was on a single machine, and so the coil radius on Trenta was the same. And so we're going to ignore that and just focus on trap flux and magnetic field. And magnetic field will scale to the 3.5 to 3.8 power, and trap flux will scale to the 1.2 to 1.5 power. These exponents are ranges because they depend on the plasma geometry as well as the plasma profile. On average for Trenta, B scaled to the 3.77 power and trap flux phi scaled to the 1.23 power. What we then are going to look at is, do these are these trends what we observed on Trenta? And the answer is yes. What we took was our yield for each shot and divided it by the trap flux to the 1.23 power and we then plotted them as a function of the magnetic field. What we're looking at here are the average of several shots. And so each blue data point is the mean of several shots and the vertical error bar that you're seeing is the standard deviation of those data. The data are fit with a nonlinear least squares fitting algorithm that was weighted by one over variance. And when we fit the data, we find that the functional form of that fit is some constant times b to the 3.77 power. Uh, verifying our expected performance. On the right, what you're seeing is a zoomed in version of our lower power shots where we have much more data. And still, we're seeing a cloud that follows that trend. The data that I just showed were integrated over an entire shot. We can also look at differential data during a shot. And this is where we start to use our plasma diagnostics. And so on the left, you're looking at the reaction rate calculated from our plasma diagnostics, measuring ion temperature, density, and, and any of the other factors that we might care about, like geometry and volume. And when we plot these data against magnetic field, we can also see that the data scale to as b to the 3.77 power. And so there are 11,000 data points here. We could easily have 10 to 100 times more on this plot still following the same trend. That's the aggregate of several shots. We can also look at a single shot differential, and that's what we're looking at on the right. And so in the red data, we're seeing the reaction rate, again, calculated from plasma diagnostics. And in the blue data, we're looking at the magnetic field to the 3.76 power. And qualitatively, we can see that these traces follow similar trends. And so we're having thermonuclear fusion that is scaling as our magnetic field. I'll note that we use 3.76 in this particular shot because the plasma distribution, the plasma uh, geometry, uh, when, we, when we use those data, we calculate that the exponent should be 3.76 here. In this presentation, we've talked about two diagnostics, and they were two of several that we used on Trenta, and we're using even more on Polaris. We're introducing more activation foils, new scintillators, new techniques to understand neutron energy and ion temperature, so on and so forth. In the bottom, you're seeing several, uh, a couple of our new detectors. In the center, it is our beryllium detector, sheets of beryllium sandwiched between scintillator. And similar to the silver detector, beryllium will get activated by fast neutrons, have a characteristic decay, and uh, decay into the organic scintillator where we detect it. And so on the right, what you're seeing is a time histogram of detections in that detector. And we see that characteristic exponential decay. Another detector that we're working on is our lanthanum bromide detector, also good for fast neutrons. And what we see on the bottom left is a linear trend between our measured yield and our expected yield, measured over several uh, experimental campaigns. This is a detector that we are developing in partnership with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is one of many partners. We partner with several other universities and several other national labs. If you are interested in partnering with us, I'm all ears. My email is in the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to reach out. With that, I'd like to end on three conclusions. First, Helion creates and fuses FRC plasmas, and we measure the performance of these plasmas with neutron diagnostics. We also verify with Trenta data that our shot-to-shot -shot variability is very low. This means that when we put the same parameters into the machine, we get similar fusion performance out of it. Lastly, as we then change these plasma parameters, we verified that the changes scaled as we expected. We saw that our fusion yield scaled as magnetic field to the 3.77 power and scaled as trap flux to the 1.23 power. My final takeaway here is that magnetic field is a super exciting way for us to scale our machines 
where we can turn that knob and turn our fusion power up by quite a bit. That's what we're doing now as we are operating Polaris. With that, thank you for listening.